So what's good, TMG fam? It's your boy Ellen. I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. Now listen, I know you had a long day, so trust me, I got a good one for y'all. So pull up a chair, let your hair down, pour yourself up a drink, and let's check out the craziness. Here we go. Number 20. Two and a half days at the bottom of the Atlantic. Now in most cases, being trapped underwater would mean instant death. The pressure, the cold, and the lack of oxygen would make survival nearly impossible. And yet, one particular man survived not for a few minutes, not for a few hours, but for three whole days at the bottom of the sea, the Atlantic no less. It all started in 2013 when Harrison boarded the Jackson 4, a tugboat off the Nigerian coast. The boat capsized, and while most of its crew met a tragic end, Harrison seemingly got lucky. He found an air pocket as the boat slowly sank underwater. However, it didn't mean he was safe. For the next 60 hours, he struggled in the dark, with only a tiny pocket of air to save him. Just imagine being in that position. You're in a dark place, and you have no idea how long the air you're breathing will last, and you have no idea whether someone will be able to find you in time. For imagine how cold he had to be. That's what I'm... Like, how did he keep himself warm is the question that I have. Fortunately, rescuers reached Harrison after about 60 hours of being underwater. And surprisingly, he survived being under the Atlantic for almost three days. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now. Number 19. The Man Who Survived a Particle Beam Particle accelerators are intricate machines that push the boundaries of our understanding of the universe. They shoot out supercharged streams of particles, exploring the very fabric of reality. Just hearing this is enough to tell you just how powerful particle accelerators are. Now, would you believe that someone survived being hit by this thing? In 1978, Vygorsky was deeply engrossed in his work at the Institute for High Energy Physics in Provino, Russia. On what seemed like a mundane day at work, life hit him with a curveball. While investigating a malfunctioning piece of equipment, he inadvertently placed his head in the path of a proton beam. I don't know why he thought it would be alright for him to do that. You'd expect him to practice extreme caution, but unfortunately, he didn't. And so, on that very day, he almost lost his life. Imagine getting zapped by something way more powerful than your typical x-ray machine, and you're pretty much there. But instead of feeling like he'd been hit by a bolt of lightning, Anatoly saw this intense flash of light. It's hard to wrap our heads around it, but that flash of light was in his brain. After getting hit by the beam, Anatoly's face swelled up like he stayed out in the sun for too long. Over time, he had some facial paralysis, which sounds painful and inconvenient, but that's immensely better than losing his life. I was about to say, at least he's still alive. And this sounds like how every superhero movie starts out, right? Hulk, Incredible Hulk, Spider-Man getting bit by a spider. Like, they need to make sure he don't have no superhuman powers or nothing now. As years passed, Bogorski continued not only to live, but also to contribute to the field he was so passionate about. Wow. Number 18. Wow. The only Japanese person who survived the Titanic. Now this goes to show that just because you're alive doesn't mean you're actually living. Just imagine, you survived one of the most tragic accidents in maritime history. You'd think that people would welcome you home with open arms, but instead, you're shunned and shamed for being alive. This is the tragic story of Masabumi Hosono. In 1912, Masabumi Hosono, a civil servant, was returning to Japan after some official business in Russia. He boarded the Titanic on his way to Japan, but as we all know, the ship sank on its maiden voyage. The night the iceberg struck, like so many others, Hosono found himself thinking he would die. The unsinkable Titanic was sinking, and there weren't enough lifeboats on board. In a moment of absolute desperation and a bit of luck, Masono managed to hop onto one of the last available lifeboats, Lifeboat 10. You'd think surviving one of the most notorious maritime disasters would earn Hosono a hero's welcome back in Japan, right? But as I've said, not exactly. Upon his return, instead of celebrating his sheer luck and willpower, many in Japan shamed and ostracized him. Some newspapers labeled him a coward for not going down with the ship, and others... What? Like, any place that's going to treat me like that, I don't need to be there, bro. Are you kidding me? You're going to shun me for surviving? You have some nerve. Like, I'd have been, bro, I, mad beyond belief. 
How do you make me feel bad for surviving something like that? wondered why he didn't give up his spot for a woman or child. The irony of it all? There were many men of various nationalities in that very lifeboat. Masono lost his job and faced public ridicule. The narrative was so strong that even decades later when his story was shared in schools, the focus was on his cowardice rather than his miraculous survival. Number 17. So they're, so I get it. They're, they're mad because he didn't give up his spot. Okay, I see that. You know what I mean? But who's to say... What? You wasn't there. You wasn't there. How can you shun that man? Y'all don't know what took place. Did he push? Now, nah, it'd have been foul if they was like, he pushed somebody out. He pushed a woman out of the way, a woman and her child out of the way to get on the lifeboat. That would have been some foulness. You know what I'm saying? But how do you even know what took place? I would definitely have to say unluckiest. 127 hours. It was 2003. And Aaron Ralston, an experienced outdoorsman, set out for a solo hike in Blue John Canyon, Utah. Little did he know that this trip would test the very limits of his mental, emotional, and physical strength. While navigating a slot of the canyon, Ralston accidentally dislodged a boulder. This 800-pound rock trapped his right forearm, pinning him against the canyon wall. Alone, with limited supplies and no way to call for help, he was forced to try and survive on his own. For five agonizing days, Ralston tried everything to free himself. He rationed his food and water, even drinking his own urine when he oh. ran out of water. He attempted to chip away at the boulder and even tried rigging pulleys to shift it, but nothing worked. As the days passed, he began recording farewell messages for his family, anticipating his impending death. Realizing that he might not be found in time and that his situation was growing more dire by the hour, Ralston made a harrowing decision. With a blunt pocket knife, he amputated his own forearm. I was afraid he was about to say that. Ah, trust me, I know it has to be. I, I know it was no other choice. You know what I mean? But whew, that's got to be like that's different because you're doing it to yourself. So each like cut. Oh man! Woo. After freeing himself from the boulder's grasp. He rappelled down a 65-foot wall and hiked several miles, where he encountered a family who assisted him and alerted authorities. Now, I don't know about you, but only a person with an immense will to live would be able to do this. To this day, Ralston's experience is one of the most extreme survival stories of our time. Number 15. Lost in the Desert In 1994, Italian police officer Mauro Prosperi took on the challenge of completing one of the toughest foot races on Earth. The Marathon de Sable. This grueling marathon spans over 155 miles across the Sahara Desert, where temperatures can rocket to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. However, a few days into the marathon, something unforeseen happened. A violent sandstorm rolled in, leaving Prosperi disoriented and separated from the group. He lost his sense of direction, wandering off the intended path and deeper into the expanse of the Sahara. Mauro spent the following days trying to survive. His supplies dwindled, forcing him to drink his urine and even consume the blood of bats he found in an abandoned shrine. He tried to leave signals and messages, hoping for rescue, but days turned into an entire week, and there wasn't any hope of being rescued. After nine harrowing days and having covered more than 180 miles, Mauro stumbled upon a group of nomadic people who rescued him. It said that he had lost 40 pounds and was on the brink of death, but against all odds, he survived. Number 14. Hanging on for dear life. The story of Chris Gursky will prove that sometimes our dream vacations can quickly turn into a nightmare. Gursky was a tourist who decided to try hang gliding. It sounded like the best idea. Seeing the enormous and serene landscape of Switzerland sounded like a dream, but again, it turned into a nightmare. In a split second, Gursky made a terrifying discovery. He wasn't properly attached to the glider. As the glider soared higher and higher, he found himself clutching onto the bar with one hand and the instructor's leg with the other, all while dangling precariously hundreds of feet above the ground. Now Gursky's insane ability to hold on for dear life saved him. If it weren't for his sheer strength, he would have fallen to his death. For a nerve-wracking 2 minutes and 14 seconds, Chris hung on to the glider. The instructor, while trying to control the glider, made attempts to pull Chris to safety but struggled due to the compromised position. Now you would think that after this terrifying encounter,
Chris wouldn't attempt to try hang gliding anymore, but this wasn't the case. In fact, he didn't even sue the company and claimed that the instructor turned out to be a pretty stand-up guy despite forgetting his harness. Number 13. Sole Survivor of an Airplane Wreck In 2009, Yamina Flight 626 carrying 153 people on board tragically crashed into the Indian Ocean near the Comoros Islands. The reports and news were grim, and the entire world believed that there were no survivors. Well, one did survive. A 12-year-old named Bahia Bakari. Bahia found herself adrift in the Indian Ocean, trying to keep afloat with the aircraft wreckage. She remained there for over nine hours, surrounded by only darkness in the ocean. Miraculously, a passing ship noticed the wreckage and the faint silhouette of Bahia clinging on. She was pulled to safety, exhausted but alive. Her rescue was nothing short of a miracle. She survived exhaustion and dehydration, which most people wouldn't be able to do. And why have we not yet figured out how to put a parachute on a plane big enough to where if that thing is in trouble, it can deploy and it can slowly descend down? Why have we not figured that out yet? You want me on a plane? That's what I need. That's simple requirements, bro. something like that. And I know it may not be simple. I don't know all the ins and outs of planes and, and I know that'd be a ton of extra weight, but come on, man. If it could save a life, let's figure it out. Number 12. RMS Titanic Survivor Now here's another Titanic survivor who, unlike Masabumi, who got shunned, was welcomed with open arms. Titanic was called the Ship of Dreams, and one of the many who aspired to start anew by boarding it was Richard Dick Williams. He wanted to start a career on the tennis courts of New York City, but unfortunately, tragedy struck. As the RMS Titanic sank into the icy depths of the ocean, William immediately assisted others helping them into lifeboats. This selfless act, however, came with a cost. Left with no other recourse, he and his fellow tennis companion Carl Bear plunged into the bone-chilling waters of the Atlantic. Mm. Fortunately for both of them, they survived and eventually got onto lifeboat number 14. Now this near-death behavior, instead of traumatizing him, really transformed his life. Rather than allowing the tragedy to deter his ambitions, William channeled his energies back into his passion. Tennis became more than just a sport for him. It became a beacon of hope, an arena where he could reaffirm his zest for life. In the subsequent years, Williams didn't just return to the court, he dominated it, clinching multiple U.S. championships and even securing a gold medal at the Olympics. A near-death experience will do that to you. It'll let you know what's important in life, and it'll remind you that every day ain't promised. You need to go hard. Number 11. Two Miles from the Sky one of the most unbelievable survival stories is that of Dr. Julianne Diller, formerly known as Julianne Kepke. In 1971, at the young age of 17, Diller experienced a harrowing situation. Julianne, along with her mother, boarded Lanza Flight 508, traveling from Lima to Pacalpa, Peru to spend Christmas with her father. The plane they boarded was their last choice to try and make it home in time, so they took the risk. However, this was the wrong decision as the plane fell apart in the sky. At the time, Julianne, still strapped to her seat, plummeted nearly two miles from the sky, only to miraculously survive the fall, with the thick trees cushioning her fall. When she regained consciousness, Julianne was alone, surrounded by the vast Amazon rainforest. Fortunately, as the child of two German zoologists, she was knowledgeable about the forest. Julianne relied on the lessons her parents gave her about navigating the wilderness of the Amazon. For ten grueling days, she endured, subsisting on rainwater and the limited food she could find, until she stumbled upon a boat in shelter. Using gasoline from the ship to extract maggots from her wounds, she waited to be rescued. Fortunately, help came, and she was found and returned to safety. Her mother didn't survive, but years later, Julianne returned to the rainforest to become a respected scientist just like her late mother. Number 10. Surviving the Atomic Bombs The 20th century was marked by several pivotal moments, but few events were as devastatingly profound as the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Being present in one of the atomic bombings is enough to end the life of someone, yet one person survived both. In August 1945, Tsutomo Yamaguchi was wrapping up a business trip in Hiroshima for his employer, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. On the morning of August 6, as he was preparing to leave the city, a bright flash enveloped the sky. 
The atomic bomb, known as Little Boy, had just been dropped on Hiroshima. Yamaguchi, although roughly three kilometers away from Ground Zero, was blown off his feet by the blast and sustained severe burns. Despite his injuries, he managed to find shelter and later medical treatment. After spending a night in Hiroshima post-bombing, Yamaguchi embarked on a challenging journey back to his hometown to reunite with his family. That hometown, faithfully, was Nagasaki. Upon reaching Nagasaki on August 8th and starting to recover, Yamaguchi shared the horrifying events of Hiroshima with his employer on August 9th, when tragedy struck again. Another flash lit up the sky, and Fat Man, the second atomic bomb, was dropped on Nagasaki. Yamaguchi had become, astoundingly, a double atomic bomb survivor. Fortunately, his family was safe from the bombing, and he lived on until the age of 93 and died in 2010. Number nine. Yeah, he was supposed to be here. He had a purpose. <laughs> he had a purpose. In the cave for 500 days, Beatrice Flamini took on a unique challenge. She decided to spend 500 days living solo in a cave in Spain. Yep, you heard that right. 230 feet below the ground. She was part of a research project. Scientists and psychologists were keeping tabs on her, studying everything from how her body reacted to the isolation to the effects of living in a cave environment. She started her cave life on November 21st, 2021, and had no clue what was happening up top. She even told her team not to inform her about any major events, even if it concerned her family. Instead of engaging with others, Beatrice Flamini spent her time reading books, exercising, drawing, painting, and knitting woolly hats during a period of silence that lasted for a year and a half. Additionally, she experienced auditory hallucinations, where her brain filled the silence with imagined sounds. After about two months, she lost track of time and thought she'd been underground for maybe 160 days when her team finally came to fetch her. Although not officially recognized by Guinness World Records, her team believes that her 500 days in a cave set a world record for voluntary cave dwelling. It's unbelievable how she remained sane without human contact for so long. I've heard this story before and I'm still blown away by it, bro. 500 days in a cave, not knowing what's going on outside in the world. Like, it just said her mind just started creating sounds that wasn't there. How do you, how do you not go stir crazy in that? I, I would be. I know she was happy to see them when they showed up to tell her she was. It was over. She didn't even think she'd been down there 500 uh, days. I just know I wouldn't have been able to survive. Would you have agreed to the same setup? Let me know in the comments down below. Now and after day one, I'd have been like, you know what? This is a mistake. <laughs> I need some type of interaction. Maybe if I was able to bring a buddy, I could probably do this, but no. Number eight, death-defying journey. How far would you go to reach your home? Well, the story of Yahya Abdi just might surprise you. Yahya Abdi was a 15-year-old Somali immigrant living in Santa Clara, California. However, he felt incredibly homesick and disconnected from his mother, whom he hadn't seen in years. This made him decide to do something unimaginable. On April 20th, 2014, Abdi scaled the fence of San Jose International Airport. Evading security, he clambered into the wheel well of a Boeing 767 bound for Maui, Hawaii. As the plane took off, Abdi, concealed in the wheel well, was subjected to freezing temperatures, low oxygen levels, and the incredible risks associated with stowing away. Remarkably, when the plane landed in Maui some five and a half hours later, Abdi emerged from the wheel well, dazed, but alive. Medical experts were baffled. The extreme conditions should have been unsurvivable. Perhaps his will to escape his house and reach his true home made him persevere and push through the journey. Number 7. In the Pacific. In 1943, Louis Zamperini and Russell Phillips flew over the Pacific on their plane, the Green Hornet. But as they were battling at the height of World War II, the plane they were riding crashed in the Pacific. But instead of having a swift rescue, Zamperini and Phillips were forced to remain in the ocean for over a month. For 47 days, they remained in shark-infested waters at the mercy of the sea. They were hungry, thirsty, and dehydrated. What's more, they were also in the middle of the battlefield. After weeks of floating aimlessly, however, they finally reached land, but their suffering wasn't over yet. Captured by the Japanese, 
Zamperini and Phillips faced brutal treatment in POW camps. The cruelty they experienced would have broken many. Most people would probably give up and lose their will to live. But these two weren't shaken. Ultimately, the two were happy to have shared the harrowing journey. Number 6. Fall from 33,000 feet. In 1972, Vesna, a Yugoslav flight attendant, found herself aboard JAT Flight 367, traveling from Stockholm to Belgrade. However, an explosion sent the plane crashing, and the aircraft disintegrated at an altitude of a staggering 33,000 feet. Now, with the plane exploding at that height, it was natural to assume that no one would have survived. And yet, against all odds, one woman survived the fall. Vesna plummeted to the ground within a section of the plane's wreckage. The area where she was found had crash-landed on a snow-covered hill, which softened the impact. When rescue workers arrived on the scene, expecting no survivors, they were stunned to discover Vesna. She had suffered a fractured skull, two broken legs, and three broken vertebrae, which left her temporarily paralyzed from the waist down. However, against all odds and medical expectations, not only did she survive the fall, but she also made close to a complete recovery. She's one of the wow. few people who got extremely lucky. Number 5. Wow. 5,500 miles away from home. In late 2012, Salvador Alvarenga, a fisherman from El Salvador, experienced something that, if you ask me, is something straight out of a movie. Salvador set out on a fishing trip off the coast of Mexico with his companion, Ezekiel, when a storm hit unexpectedly. The two were left to fend for themselves in the vast Pacific with limited supplies in a small boat. To survive, the two men caught fish with their hands, collected rainwater for drinking, and even consumed sea turtles and seabirds when they could catch them. However, there were many times when they thought they would die. It seemed that they would fare well enough until they reached land, but Ezekiel lost his life after a few months. Meanwhile, Salvador continued his journey, and in January 2014, he finally reached land. His boat washed ashore on a remote atoll in the Marshall Islands, an astonishing 5,500 miles from where he started sailing. For reference, that's like traveling from the United States to Belgium in Europe. He was emaciated, weak, and dehydrated, but he was alive. Fortunately, two couples found him later and helped him get immediate aid. Now, I ain't gonna lie, y'all. This is making me start to not want to go anywhere. <laughs> I mean, just not want to go anywhere. These, you hearing about this type of stuff, man. Maybe one of y'all got a trip planned or something like that. Be safe out there. For four, 40 days in the Amazon. Would you have survived in the Amazon jungle for 40 days? Well, I know I wouldn't be able to do so. And yet, against all odds, three young siblings survived. You know what? I'm going to stop saying I can't. I I could, you know what I mean? I would survive if something happened to me. You know what I mean? That will to want to live, you don't realize how strong it is. In the wilderness alone, Leslie was 13 years old, Selene was 9, and Noriel was only 4 when they got lost in the Amazon after their plane crash. Initially, the kids relied on the provisions left behind by the wreck to survive, but as the food ran out, they had no choice but to try and navigate through the Amazon forest. Their indigenous background and knowledge of the forest played a crucial role in their survival. Experts believe that their upbringing equipped them with the skills to navigate and thrive in a challenging environment. Most young children wouldn't be able to fend for themselves in the wild. Yet, these children increased their survivability through their skills. Against all odds, rescuers later found the three siblings weak, but still very much alive. Number 3. Only Survivor of a Volcanic Eruption now, Ludger Silveris was a man who survived the impossible by complete coincidence and only through sheer luck. It all started in the city of Saint-Pierre on the island of Martinique. By 1902, the city's inhabitants lived beneath the looming Mount Pili, a volcano that had begun to show unsettling signs of activity. Despite the increasing tremors and smoke, life in Saint-Pierre continued, with the residents unaware of the impending tragedy. At the time, Ludger Silberis was caught due to an altercation and was thrown into solitary confinement. He was thrown into a small cell underground, and although it must have felt like hell to him, it saved him from a tragic death. On May 8, 1902, Mount Pili unleashed its full fury in a catastrophic eruption, expelling a scorching pyroclastic flow that consumed everything in its path. Within minutes, Saint-Pierre, with its population of nearly 30,000, was obliterated. 
The city was reduced to a fiery wasteland with seemingly no survivors. Well, at least, it looked like no one survived. Ludger Silberis, severely burned but alive, had astonishingly survived the volcanic cataclysm. The thick walls of his prison cell, which punished him and mocked him several days ago, were the ones that saved him from the fiery lava that burned the city. Although I would have thought it would have made it feel like an oven in there. Though he was punished for an altercation before the tragedy, he was still considered a survivor after the disaster. It's pretty jarring to think that out of more than 30,000, only a single soul survived. Yeah. Number 2. Alexander Selkirk Perhaps you've heard or read about the tale of Robinson Crusoe as a kid. His novel revolves around him being shipwrecked several times, but always finding a way to escape the sticky situation. Well, did you know that it's inspired by a real story? The story of Alexander Selkirk. It all began in 1704 when Selkirk reached the sink ports. At that point, Selkirk believed that the ship wouldn't be able to keep him afloat, so he decided to deliberately shipwreck himself on the uninhabited Juan Fernandez Islands off Chile. For four years and four months, Alexander Selkirk called this island home. No other human company, just wild goats to call friends. He used the resources around him, like making clothes out of goat skins, and he spent his time reading his Bible. Selkirk became a master at hunting and even tamed some local feral cats to help with the rat problem. In 1709, Selkirk's hopes soared when he spotted a ship. Using a vantage point, he caught the attention of the passing crew. He was finally rescued. Returning to civilization, Selkirk's tale spread like wildfire, and his story became the inspiration for Robinson Crusoe. And now, it's wow. time for today's topic. A man in a small town got into an accident and was considered comatose after multiple damages to his body. Many believed it was useless to keep him alive through a machine. But the man woke up from a 19-year coma, and what he told disturbed everyone. The locals and the workers at the hospital were in a state of disbelief. Many claimed that the man began talking about wild visions and memories from his time in the coma. He hinted at a world that is beyond our understanding. What lies in the afterlife? And what do those who have had a brush with death see? Number one. It, that, it ain't even that, bro. Like, giving up on people, man. Like, it ain't over till it's over. That man just woke up from how many years? 19 years, they said? I bet them people are glad they didn't give up on him. Surviving the Antarctic Continent. It was the early 20th century, and Antarctica is among the last places on Earth we have yet to explore. Sir Douglas Mawson was among the many who dared to brave its icy landscape. In 1912, Mawson led an Australasian Antarctic expedition. Things were going relatively smoothly until, on a trek away from their main base, disaster struck. Mawson's fellow explorers, Belgrave Ninnis and Xavier Mertz, met tragic ends, leaving Mawson alone in the harshest environment on Earth. Not to mention, most of their supplies and the sled dogs were lost in a fall. Mawson, now alone, had to journey 100 miles back to his base camp with limited rations and gear. He needed to survive while suffering from frostbite, hunger, and extreme isolation. That cold is unforgiving. There were times when Mawson was so exhausted and malnourished that he'd fall into the snow only to force himself back up and continue. He even crafted makeshift snowshoes from the leftover sled materials to trudge through the white wilderness. Through sheer willpower and perseverance, Mawson eventually made it back to base. However, he arrived just in time to see his rescue ship leaving the continent. Oh. Bad luck with timing, right? Well, fortunately, it was just a close call, and the ship saw Mawson's distress signal. And so, after many harrowing days in the Antarctic, Mawson finally went home. Do you believe that when it's your time to go, you won't escape death no matter what? Well, perhaps... Yeah, that's the thing, man. When it's your time, it's your time. If it ain't your time to go, it ain't your time. And you'll be able to survive some crazy near-death experiences. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure y'all know of some, probably that you may experience yourself, or you know somebody close to you that went through something similar, man. You just you just start to believe, man, when it's my time. And then obviously, like I said earlier, I'm here for a purpose. You know what I mean? So I'm I'm taking advantage of each day to the fullest. And that's how you got to view your life, man. Y'all get at me in the comment section, man. Let me know what you thought of this video. And stick around and stay tuned. Till the next one, I'm gone. Peace.